Hey. First of all, thank you everybody for actually coming out tonight. I know that everyone's been working all day and this is a little extra, but I think that people who go a little extra tend to get a little extra. So I really appreciate y'all coming out. Uh, let me help get to know you a little bit so maybe I can tailor my presentation a bit, change a few things up. How many people are already working as product managers or in product in some way? All right, good. Your hands work. This is awesome. That's a lot of people. How many people are interested in getting into this field and are tr maybe interviewing right now, that sort of thing? Would that be relevant to you? Perfect. Uh, what about other folks? Shout it out. Is there another reason why you're here tonight? You, you're not a product manager. You're not interested in being a product manager. Maybe you work with them. Uh, what's Any other reasons for it be coming out tonight? All right. Just going to learn the career options. Um, Brenna? That's awesome. So just learning, getting a little bit of knowledge, learning all the different buzzwords, how the pieces fit together, and maybe a little bit because I twisted your arm to come tonight. <laughs> all right, perfect. Well, I'll make sure that we cover a little bit about what life as a product manager, at least in my experience, as well as how to get into that role, how to understand it, how to figure out how the pieces fit together. First, a little bit about me. My name is Alexander Lovell. Uh, Sam already gave me a pretty good intro, but I am the director of product management for Salesforce Search. That means that I'm responsible for the front end of our uh, number one most used component and our number 13 most used, over half a million daily active users uh, for my products at Salesforce. Uh, before I got into Salesforce, I actually, I didn't come from a technical background. I didn't come from uh, the background that a lot of product managers come from. I started my career in strategy consulting uh, right here in the city in San Francisco uh, with LEK Consulting. Did a lot of product strategy, market launches, uh, that sort of thing. Then I left there because I wanted to build something. I want to make things. Um, so I went and started a company, ran that for a couple of years as sort of the head of product and COO. And then I had this intermediate period of a couple months where I was interviewing for product manager gigs. Hope maybe some of you know how that goes. It's a very difficult thing to get into for a lot of people because you'll see folks from marketing backgrounds, from engineering backgrounds, from everything in between wanting to become product managers. So I understand if you're, if you're trying to get that edge, to, to get that your foot in the door the first time. Uh, and then since and then I've been at Salesforce for a couple of years, I started out running our customer community, which is a couple million members, uh, and now and now search. So hopefully that gives you a good sense that I, I've come for, I can I've touched on a few different backgrounds that might be represented in the room tonight. If I don't have yours, just be sure to shout out questions as things go. I'll have a QA at the end. But if there's something that you just can't get past during the presentation, Maybe you're not the only one, so raise your hand and, or shout it out. You won't upset me. Well, let's get into it. First of all, quick, quick topics for today. First of all, be more aware. Uh, it's, you'll, you'll understand a little bit more about what I mean by that in, uh, in a bit. Making better trade-offs, that's critical to being a product manager. Communicate more clearly, and ultimately, we're going to win more, whatever that means in your particular circumstance. This... This is the phrase I hate most in the entire world. <laughs> I hate this phrase, be, you know, I have to do that, this, you have to do that. Let's be crystal clear right here and now. You don't have to do anything. In this world, in this life, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to go to the grocery store, but you won't have fresh produce at home. You don't have to obey the speed limit, but you might get a ticket. And you don't have to call your mom, really, no matter what she says, but it's going to be a really cold Christmas if you don't. Okay? It's just that, in fact, you are constantly prioritizing, whether you're doing it consciously or not. That's what depends. And I, you're balancing the returns, the consequences, the feelings of different options. And the reason that I hate have to is that it short circuits all of that. It makes whatever you have to do your number one priority implicitly you have to do it you don't have an option and when you have too many number one priorities you feel that stress maybe a little panic even you you make bad decisions bad things happen when you have too many top priorities and you don't know how to distinguish between them and have to piles on and piles on and piles on it's not just it's, it applies to daily life and it really applies to product management so 
I, it makes me sad because I find that after a lifetime of have to things, a lot of people never actually get what they say they truly want. It, it's really sad to think of giving up of the life that you want for yourself for a lifetime of errands you have to do, jobs you have to do, social obligations you have to fulfill. Now, break out of that. We'll be a little bit more aware. We'll be more conscious by the end of this presentation about how we're prioritizing those things. Now, a framework of consciously prioritizing is directly related to product management. Product management, as some of you have figured out, means different things in different companies, different products. Everyone has a different set of responsibilities, but there is one true north. There is one thing that product managers are always responsible for, and that is the product roadmap. If you, and the product roadmap is always being buffeted by a lot of things that are urgent that you have to do. And if you let those pile up and pile on top of the things that you want to do that are important for your product that will make you and your customers successful, then you will lose control of your product roadmap that is the core of your job. All right. Just a little, another little audience participation, I promise. There's not gonna be too much of this. We're not gonna have any Ellen DeGeneres dancing in your seats. I'm not gonna make this side say hip and this side say hop. We're just gonna do one more. Shout out a couple things that come at you, especially product managers in the room. What are some of the things that happen that you have to do or people tell you you have to do that might pile on, that might disrupt the work you're trying to accomplish? I'll go first. Bugs. Bugs, 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 always bugs. There is always an urgent bug and it's usually attached to a customer case and somebody's yelling at you. <laughs> Any other examples that come to mind? Uh, we need to close this deal. Absolutely. The one-off, hey, if we just do this, we're gonna close that deal. Happens all the time. Anybody else? Sales department understanding the product. What's that? Sales department understanding the product. Sales doesn't understand the product, so they don't know how to sell the product, which means that you have a problem with your product. <laughs> At least you have a problem with your top line. I see these all the time. Customer cases, design issues or inconsistencies. Security, that's a huge one. Accessibility, if you don't know what that is, that's so that everyone uh, with disabilities, blind, deaf, can use your product. Performance, performance is laggy, we gotta fix that. Now, this is a famous quote from Dwight Eisenhower. Let's talk about what is important. What's important is whatever makes your customers more successful over time. That could be over the course of releases, uh, over years, over sprints, whatever the case may be. And sometimes the things we just talked about are important, but sometimes they're not. And the first step to differentiating is recognizing all of your options. Now, the way to lead your team product, your company forward, maybe there's, I think I met a couple CEOs in the room, is to change your priorities from unconscious to conscious, right? So remember I said I hate the phrase have to because it short circuits all of that thinking? It's an unconscious way of prioritizing everything that you have to do. But if you crack it, each of those have to's open, there is a knowable implication or consequence associated with that. And the moment you get into that mindset of, no, 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 I, I understand that this is really critical to you, that this feels like the most urgent thing in your life. Let me, let me understand that. Let me understand a little bit. What happens if we don't do that? What happens if we do? What are the trade-offs? What are the consequences? Who does it affect? We'll get into more of that, but you just gotta break that, ditch have to, and break that open. Let me give you a quick example. Customer support team, tells you that they've found a bug, right? Um, you've got a customer yelling at you about it. It, to them, the person dealing with that customer, it is the most important thing happening that day, that week. And so they tell you, you have to fix this. And you should take a step back from that and crack it open like we just talked about. What are, how many users is this affecting? How many customers is this affecting? What is the effect on them? Do they, is there a known workaround? Is it just an annoying, is it annoying but there's a workaround? Or is it a complete business stopping issue? You start asking some of those questions and very quickly you'll tease out the differences in all of these have to's and you'll, and your prioritization will become clear. It doesn't happen immediately, but it'll happen. So 
resist distractions, focus on the important, make conscious decisions. Take that unconscious, that, imp that implied prioritization and make it something that you have a really strong handle on and can work with. So what? So what, right? That's the whole point of everything. Everything in Silicon Valley, so what? Tell me what it matters. Will, did this help me be more successful as a product leader? Absolutely. It'll make you more employable, more promotable, more successful in making your customers successful. To understand all of the options available and to be able to weigh them intelligently. Right? The best path leads to the outcomes for you. And when you have this, when you know all the options, you're free to choose the best path. And really the ability to pick the right path from a variety of options while under stress is the primary qualification of leadership. Now, when, so let's, yeah, the, the one thing I, or the other thing I really want to touch on here that gets lost as we think about building the product roadmap is that you don't, as a PM, get to tell anyone what to do. I work with dozens of engineers, uh, user experience designers, uh, accessibility performance engineers, QE, tons of people, and none of them report into me. I don't tell them what to do. And frankly, having been the founder of a company, I recognize that you never get to tell anyone what to do, no matter what the org chart says. No, our job is to convince people what to do, to convince them that the path that I believe is right, that I've worked hard to define as the right path forward, is what they should be working on too. It matters, it matters with your engineers, it matters with your designers, it matters when you're recruiting and you're trying to bring in new people. And apparently it matters when you have other things to do. Sorry about that. Just dismiss that real quick. What does it say I have to do? Anything? You need to get 70 in. Oh crap, that stinks. <laughs> ah, so, in order for you to win, it's about making, being the most, building the most successful product possible. And in order for you to get there, you gotta bring people along with you. Now, let's talk about a little bit more about how to do that. First of all, I'm gonna need to decide smarter, communicate better, and that's how I'm gonna win more. When I'm deciding, when you are fully conscious of all the options, you can make better decisions because you can actually weigh up all those differences. Let's get into it a little bit more. Decision making for product leaders uh, is heavily skewed towards really big decisions. If you are making big decisions every day, and I'm talking about big decisions as in, should we launch this product at all? Let's, let's like strategic decisions, right? Should we launch this product? What market should we go into? Uh, should we buy this company to better round out our product? Those decisions are important and there are a lot of resources available to you. I, I will only touch on these in this presentation because I know a lot of you are interviewing. And these sorts of frameworks are gold when you're interviewing because they, they force you to internalize some of the key lessons and trade-offs that you need to be making. And they show that you can think in a structured way. Uh, the key is to lay out the whole framework first before diving into the one part that you really want to talk about. Uh, that's, that tends to be what people do is like, I'm coming from marketing. Marketing is a consideration here. So let me tell you 15 minutes about how this affects marketing and never mention how it affects pricing and revenue and engineering and support, right? So we're gonna to touch on this really quickly, but the goal here is just to internalize these and then move past them to the tactical decisions that define a product manager's day that are 99% of what you're actually gonna be doing. And once you're in the job, will define whether or not you're successful. So Blue Ocean, I love this one because it's super simple. Uh, blue Ocean is you're going to make more money if you go into an area that's not crowded than if you go into an area that is crowded, where there will be price competition, we'll all compete, the water will get bloody, it's a red ocean. There's the name. Um, you can you look all of these up and internalize them, but we're just going to touch on them quickly. Kano model, that's what you see here, and it's really about, uh, I have these baseline of features that I need to achieve for my users. This is also relevant when you're launching a new feature. This baseline I need to hit. And after that, I get diminishing returns from improving that baseline. At a certain point, nobody cares if I, uh, performance gives me a pretty steady benefit, right? If it's really getting faster, people almost always see the value in that. 
But at a certain point, you gotta hit these excitement features or delight features and delight your user. Uh, my favorite, uh, quick example on this is the camera on your phone. When you first, when they first put a camera on the phone, the point was, well, it works. There's a camera on my phone. That's great. That's amazing. Then it took, they needed to take better pictures. And then I had these performance elements of it. I need more megapixels, right? Higher quality pictures. Um, I need to be able to store more pictures on my phone. And now we're in this excitement features or delight features phase of this where there's a whole new opportunity in putting filters on your Instagram photos and having Snapchat put little dog faces on you. Uh, you can visualize it for yourself. Uh, but the, that's the life cycle there and that's the whole Kano model. And the balanced scorecard is like, let's just look at the different aspects of our business, our internal processes, our customers, our product, our learn, the way we learn and score e the product on each of these different measures and then see how we're stacking up. Those are some of the things that you should look into when you're trying, if what you want to do is make that really big product decision, for example, if you're thinking about starting your own company. But this, this is the everyday stuff. And this is what we're really going to spend a little bit more time on. Uh, because tools for success every day are much less talked about, but they are more important to your actual ability to do your job as a product manager. You need really a toolbox of these simpler concepts. I'm going to go over four of them today. There are a lot more, but you'll find that you can recombine them in ways that are really powerful. And then, and they help you to frame trade-offs in a way that make you make better decisions. And we'll also see how that translates into better communicating your decisions and being in a place where you can constantly revise and take in input. First, I am going to touch on this very simple formula. Um, it is the single most common request for product managers. I bet half of you in this room could say it out loud is, can you do more work in less time? Everyone had a boss like that? It's great that you're doing that. I need it yesterday. And actually, if you could add on this other section, that'd be stellar. This, I, we had a really tough time in one of my uh, first months at Salesforce. I was coming from a small company. I didn't really understand how the big company worked. Um, so I wasn't really playing uh, playing my customers, internal stakeholders well. Um, and I went to a mentor of mine and I said, geez, this internal customer of mine, she is just just killing me. Every time, it's, she's just so frustrated that we're, that we're not accomplishing more. I tell her what the es engineering estimates are, what the reasonable expectations are, but it's always, I need more, I need more, I need more, I need it faster. And it was causing me so much stress. I mean, I was waking up in the morning thinking about this, which is not a great place to be, uh, at least if you're not waking up with a smile. <laughs> And my mentor, who's a very successful uh, exec at, at Salesforce, said to me, it's a, it's a product management boils down to the simplest formula in the world. Output equals resources times time. You want more output? I need more resources or I need more time. You can balance that, you're going to be balancing that equation all day long, but it's a really helpful way to just make it dead simple in your mind and also to communicate to other people. People are not unreasonable. They just have different incentives, different goals than you do. So if you can get them to walk a little bit in your shoes, hey, these are the resources I have. This is, I, I'm not the engineer here. I, this is how well much output we can do in this much time. It can be really helpful. I've even had success doing that with customers. And customers are saying, I need this, I need this, I need this. And I'm saying, all right, here's what we can accomplish in this amount of time. Work with me here. And very quickly, that conversation becomes a lot more constructive. A couple caveats. Uh, for those of you with a little economics in your background, this is not a perfectly elastic equation. Doubling the amount of resources does not mean that I can double the amount of output in the next six months. It takes time to, to hire, to ramp up, for, people, for me to ramp up new people, for me to teach the existing people to get really comfortable with everything. It's not perfectly elastic. Um, the... Most, the oldest cliche in product is perhaps the truest. Just because one woman can make a baby in nine months doesn't mean that nine women can make a baby in one month. Uh, it's not original, but it is accurate. <laughs> and it will reset 
people's thinking for you because they've all heard it so many times and nodded along to it. And it's very hard for them to disagree with you in that moment. Let's see if this actually works. Wow. It does not. Great. Ah, there we go. Come on, Internet. Nope. Not doing a lot of Internet. Um, ben Affleck's going to interrupt me in a second. But when you're having these conversations, often adding... Yeah? No? That is so weak. Where are you, Sam? Come on, eat some audio. Ah. Okay. Because of this formula, often when for me to add an additional piece of input, if it doesn't come with new resources or a longer deadline, it means that I need to uh, take away, subtract another piece of output, right? And that's what Ben Affleck's saying here is that when you're on the phone trying to make a sale, either you sell them on why they need to on buying this product, or they sell you on a reason why not. And it's the same thing in a lot of product discussions, when people come to you making requests, trying to adjust things. They say, I, I need this, you, I need, you have to do it for me. I'm selling you on it. And I say, all right, great. Tell me what I should drop. Let's look at it. What has to, what has to die so that this can live? And the difference between working in a boiler room and working in technology is that it's not a zero sum game. That's a really important thing to remember. You are winning whether you sell them or they sell you. Because at the end of the day, your goal is to build the right thing. It's, and if they've made your roadmap better by giving you a project that should have been at the top of your list to begin with, then they've saved you from messing up. And if you've, and if you've convinced them that what's going on is most important, then you are, then you were already there, but now everyone's on the same page and you don't have to deal with that again. All right? So it's really important to remember your colleagues will push you to measure, refine, and revise your product roadmap in the same way that your customers will ask you to measure, refine, and revise your product. It's an ongoing thing. All right, this thing. Come on, next slide. Never putting a video on one of these things again. <laughs> okay, so let's talk a little bit about some of these tools for the everyday. Tools to make me have a productive conversation with my colleagues uh, to help us frame these things in a way where we're not be we're not having an emotional conversation. So, one strategic context, super simple. Tie your little piece of of work to a big strategic initiative for your company. This works really well. This works. Sometimes better at big companies, but any company with a strong strategic direction, which tends to be every successful company, you can understand, you should understand how your piece fits into the broader whole, and you need to communicate that to people so that they understand if we don't de deliver this piece, our strategy will not be as successful. And if they come back to you and say, well, that, strat that strategy is less important than this other strategy, then maybe you need to have a conversation about that. But tie your thing to the strategic context of your whole company. Don't make it about this little piece versus that little piece. Next up, stakeholder success. The thing that should resonate best with all of your colleagues is we're going to make our customer more successful, right? We're going to make this company more successful. Put your things in the context of that stakeholder success and understand how to weigh the utility between them. So, for example, uh, at Salesforce, we have different types of users. Every company really has different types of personas of their customers. Marketing people know that term really well, personas. Um, and then there's the sheer size of the problem, right? So if I say, for example, I, I had a conversation not uh, just last week, actually, where... Someone was asking me to build a feature for our developers, because Salesforce is a platform, people develop products for it. Um, and they were trying to fix a problem that, that addressed a really a narrow but important use case in that. And then I had another thing that I really had to do a one-to-one -one comparison on, because it was, it was near the bottom of my roadmap here, um, that was about all of our end users, and it was a much broader problem. And so there were two aspects in which I, I framed that discussion. One 
is that end users are really who define the reputation of the success or failure of this company. And, and developers are, frankly, have many more, are much more capable of troubleshooting for themselves than our average end user. So they can get around this problem a little better. And two, one problem is affecting a narrow swath of our, of our Pan customers. And another problem is affecting three times as many in this case. That's a, that's a really simple way to explain to someone how you landed on the decision you landed on. And maybe they'll come back to you and say, yeah, but that's, but mine is a business stopping issue. And the other one's a minor annoyance. And then you need to have that, you need to add in that additional layer. But putting it in the context of how are we making our customers more successful is a really powerful way to frame things quickly. And again, these, fr these little tools are all about doing it on an everyday way that's constructive and lightweight so that I can do it 10 times a day instead of the previous frameworks where we saw where it'll take me 10 days to do it once. Next up, simplest thing in the world, cost versus benefit. Uh, you can call this return on investment. You can call it whatever you want. How, what, what do I get for what I have to pay? So I think everyone pretty much understands that intuitively, but you'd be shocked how often it comes up in discussions of, you know, multi-million dollar projects of how much is it going to cost me to fix this problem? And then what do I get when I do fix that problem? It's again, super simple framing, very powerful. And then lastly, uh, two by twos. The, uh, someone came up to me and was asking me about, uh, what do you do with your consulting background? Here's a great time to use your consulting background and frame everything in a little four square box. You remember that game when you were a kid and there's just four squares? This is a two by two. The most important part of this discussion, the thing that people overlook the most is that it's not about what goes into your grid. You are defining and controlling the conversation the moment that you agree on what the two dimensions, what the two axes of discussion are. That's, the key moment in that discussion. If we agree on what those axes are, then it's very easy for us to figure out where things fit. What's really hard is to figure out, are these the top two most important things to be considered? And often, so I'll, I'll draw this up and I'll say, so we agree that, you know, uh, user value and number of effect on users are the things that we should be value doing. So we want to be in the top right here where it's the most valuable to the most people. Right? Dead simple. And then you think you, you might think you're done. And then someone comes back and says, well, actually, I don't think that number of users should be the right, should be the measure there. It should be the value of their contracts or something like that. And now you're actually having a really much more productive, focused conversation around what matters. And if your company has those things well defined, it becomes a short conversation. If your company doesn't have those things well defined, it becomes a very important conversation where you define those things. <laughs> but either way, you're just putting things together, agreeing on what the terms of our conversation are, so that at no point does this conversation become me versus you. That is toxic when it becomes, and it can really easily get there. In fact, that, that drives me right into this communication piece. Many conversations, even in business, are really emotional conversations masquerading as some business conversation. That can happen really easily, for example, when a colleague needs something from you. A team is dependent on your work to be successful in theirs. And you have to, and you have to tell them no. You have to tell them, I'm sorry, that's not the most important thing for me to be working on or for my teams to be working on. That turns really quickly into conflict, emotional conflict and as a product manager, again, not telling people what to do, but convincing them to come along with you, you need those relationships to be healthy. If you're all constantly having emotional knockdown, drag out battles over something, you might walk out of the room with your, with your roadmap the way you think it ought to be, but you're not going to win. You're not, because you always have to win together. All right? So you can break out of that loop by focusing on the implications of competing priorities in the ways that we just discussed. Use those tools to make this not about me and you, but to communicate the implications of what's happening in a way that's constructive and not personal. This is also a critical moment to be bringing in data. This is where data can be extremely powerful to you. This presentation isn't about uh, bringing data in discussions. That's a whole other hour. But it's important to remember that 
when you come with that da those data elements, those are often your trump card. And that's a great way to say, this isn't about whether I like you or not. It's not about me doing you a favor. It's about, it's about the data. And it's simple. And it's about this, and it's about these little frameworks. What's the cost and what's the benefit? Right? Just, just short circuits that a little bit in a way that's very powerful. Um, and the most important, and, and this ties back to our original point of well, as well, about being conscious about these different things. When, when you are truly conscious about breaking apart these, these different trade-offs, that's when you can actually have those conversations be really constructive. People can go years and years in their lives without really recognizing the trade-offs that they're making. And if you're doing that, it's going to come out in these conversations and you're going to lose that rational thread. I'm not saying that all these conversations are, are all about rationality. That wouldn't be true. But there, but you can have that rational thread that brings us to a place of common understanding. And if you are unable to understand the, the trade-offs, every aspect of the trade-offs, if you ever are stuck on, a, I have to do this, then you can't get to that healthy place. And uh, last thing I'll say, remember, it's, it's not actually about the decision. Long term, it doesn't really matter what if your team works on this for two weeks or that for two weeks, especially if they're both kind of going to get done. It's, that's so much less important than how you arrive there. It's, you're, I'm back to sophomore math class. Show your work. It's about how you arrive at that decision because your, your decisions are going to be questioned over and over and over again. Don't think you wrote it down and it's done. Your, question, your decision will be questioned over and over. You will have these conversations of refining and revising over and over. And if you cannot, and you have to be able to explain how you arrive there in a way that other people can understand quickly and, and they can challenge your premises, but not your logic. Right? That's how we get there. Question? So this will work with product managers. Absolutely. I'm a UX manager. I'm so, so sorry. I make you very sad, don't I? <laughs> Not always. Um, are there ways that folks who work alongside product managers can ask better questions of their PMs to get at some of this information? Like, as a PM, yeah. what would you like me to ask you instead of just getting frustrated and saying, like, man, I really disagree with your priorities? Yeah. I think that everyone, the, the PM tends to be a bit of a central hub for a lot of things, for UX, for marketing, pricing, security, lots of things. It, it all ideally is funneling through the product manager before it's getting to uh, engineering or the people who actually, you know, do things. <laughs> uh, so the most important things for me to consider are, are first try and, and walk a little bit in those holistic shoes and understand how, in your case, the user experience also affects the security, how it affects the, I mean, I'm sure you're already up on accessibility, but how does it affect performance? Really pretty things tend to take longer to load than really ugly things. It's not always true, but it's often true. Um, and uh, the, I'd say the one that comes up the most is how much engineering effort is this. Uh, that is where you can have a really healthy conversation with a product manager. And as a product manager, you should be proactive in helping people understand those things. You should not be waiting for someone who took time out of their evening to come learn about product management so that they can be better with you. You will have very little success if you wait for those people in your life. You need to go out and say, okay, I understand that that's the ideal. I'm totally with you there. You're the expert in this area. Let me, but I think I, I can't commit to that much effort. The cost benefit isn't there. So, is there a way for us to get much of the value for my consultant, 80-20 it, right? Is there a way for me to get a lot of the value with a significantly reduced effort? I find that often there is, not always. Sometimes, sometimes the secret sauce is that last bit, it's the polish, it's the delight. But a lot of times you can get most of the way there um, by, take, by taking a, a smaller step that that addresses the core issue. So as a product manager, it's your jo job to understand what that core issue is, to to get break through those have tos and requests, and then to communicate not only to other product people but also to the other stakeholders on your team what it is that you're dealing with. Okay, I can dive a little deeper on that if you want in the breakout, but I think that's probably is that good for everybody to kind of. Okay, great. So what we want to do to get back to communication is frame the trade off, help people understand how to walk in your shoes a little bit, explain how you make decisions, use these tools that we've talked about. Again, it 
Don't do the, don't do the heavy ones every day. Do the light, the easy ones. Sketch out that two by two. Tell people about the ROI on something, right? And then you can arrive together at the same conclusion. And once you have arrived at that conclusion, often there's a little bit of wiggling at the end and that's when you, you need to be a bit firm, right? Hey, we, we arrived, we came here together. What do you mean you don't want to be here? Right. Uh, I'm sorry that, that this isn't everything that you, you dreamed of when you walked into this meeting, but like you got to be firm a little bit there because otherwise even the most rational conversation can drag on forever. Um, but the key is you got to be able to say no and stay friends because that relationship is more important than any individual decision. Now, let's talk about a little bit about communication practices. And I promise I'll, uh, well, I think we only have about five more minutes here, so I'll, I'll get it tightened up at the end here. Practices for every day in order to communicate better. Prepare. There's absolutely no substitute for it. I'm sorry, it's work. I, I don't have, I don't have a response for that. It's work. If you, often the better prepared person is the one who can control the conversation. You, if you need to be well prepared in order to be the one who sets up these, these tools, who brings the data, who is able to short circuit those emotional pieces that can be so toxic if they are misdirected, right? Empathize. You, <laughs> you are typically dealing with other product people or you are dealing with people who are experts in their field in the way that you probably will never be. Whether it's your, you know, lead architect, your uh, UX person, your security person, you don't know their world. Empathize. Try and understand where they're coming from. And that will help you to, un to set up the right decision even when the other person is having trouble communicating effectively to you. Bring data. Again, it's part, it's tied into preparing, but it's a really powerful tool. Um, you'd be shocked. Well, some of you wouldn't be shocked. The ratio of people talking about the importance of data to the number of people who actually do the work to come prepared with a piece of data is insane. Everyone is like, we're data driven. We want to be data driven. Guess what? Everyone's saying they want to be data driven. You're going to be in, you're going to win if you actually provide data in a way that nobody else is do, able to do the work for. It works a shocking amount of the time. And again, it creates healthy communication because it also reminds the person that if they want to convince you, they need to bring data. Right? And then lastly, we've talked a little bit about relationships, but only in sort of how they can fall apart. You also need to be proactive in building them up. If every time somebody hears from you, they know you're going to ask them for something, they know you're going to wreck their day, they don't want to pick up the phone. You're going to get, you're going to be, you're halfway to losing before you even start. Take the time out, build those relationships with the people that you work a lot with, and that shouldn't be limited to, uh, to your engineers. It shouldn't be limited to other PMs. It needs to be a sort of holistic 360. Who are the people that I talk to every day and whose decisions affect me? Take the time, build those relationships. It will pay off. It will. Uh, and you will absolutely miss the absence of them. I can guarantee you that if you don't make, put in the time. So, oh, yeah. Um, a word on, on preparation and data. You're probably not Steve Jobs. You just probably aren't. Product managers uh, as a class suffer from this, this ego that you are the visionary, that you, you see around the corner, and that I don't really care what the customer's telling me. Even, even if I bother to do the work to listen to the customer, they just don't know because they can't see that next thing the way that I can. I'm a product professional here. Product professional. <laughs> maybe, maybe once in a long, long while that's true. Maybe it's true. But 99% of the time, I would say it's probably even higher than that. Your customer knows what they need better than you do, and you should just go listen to them. And then you should ask at those five whys so that you're not just listening, you're listening really actively and really well so that you understand the most basic primal urge that is pushing them to ask you for this feature. Is it, you know, they're, they're frustrated, they're angry, whatever. Not every product is you understanding the iPad or the smartphone or whatever better than anybody else possibly could. Most, so be, be humble about it. And don't try to beat anyone. We all get there together or we get there dysfunctionally. <laughs> 
If you are trying to win, I know I've framed a few things as winning, um, but again, it's not zero sum. You need to, you get there, you arrive together, and those, and that's how you build those relationships. That's how you're successful in the long term. That's how you, and, and frankly, for those of you who are interviewing, if you don't, if you don't have that mentality of collaboration, of working together, I'm not going to hire you. <laughs> now, I've touched a couple times on measuring, refining, and revising. I'm, I think this is pretty clear to most people. Uh, but maybe if you're, if you're coming in as a first-time product manager, you don't quite get it. You think, I go and I make the roadmap, and then we go and execute against that roadmap. No. No, 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 no. You refine and revise that thing. It is a living document. It is constantly breathing, and it will never, ever be complete. Do not fall in love with your own words on the page because it will prevent you from doing what you need to do, which is measure the outcomes, refine your approach, revise your plan over and over and over again. All right, so we're just, just to summarize really quickly, we are balancing trade-offs, communicating clearly, and then we got to improve, keep getting better at it. It's never, it's never over. Terrific. All right, and that is how you win more. That is how, when you're conscious of all of the competing factors, you know how to put them together into simple tools that will make you more effective in decision making. And then you know how to communicate those tools in a way that other people can understand, follow your logic, and work with you in a way that's constructive. That's how we all get together and, and win. And winning is making your customer more successful. All right. So if you, if you buy into that, and into the concepts I've laid out, and keep your ego from getting in the way, uh, I just know that everyone here can do something great. You're going to build something amazing. Don't get, don't get bogged down in the, in the minutia. Stay focused on what's important. Keep communicating. Keep getting better. And that is where you'll end up. All right. Thanks a lot. Cool. If anyone uh, needs to jet, this is a good moment, but I will stick around for a QA. and uh, Just put your, put your hand up I've, and we'll figure it out. So this guy's up first. Yeah. Trying to understand the implications and trade off of something that the user asked for. Mm -hmm. um, I've had issues in the, in the past with trying to get them to bring something concrete, like a why. Yeah. Um, show me, maybe have them bring me through their experience so I can understand what they're more concretely in. Okay. I'd be able to tell them, here's, hey, I've seen their experience. Yeah. Um, I'd love to know more about what you feel is like a, what's fair to ask of a customer, even like a new customer. Um, for things to validate and really help help you and your team understand the implications of what they're asking for. Okay. So you can help you know, prioritize. And right. I think it's a constant challenge. I'm, I'm going to paraphrase you just for the mic, sure. uh, which is that if I understood correctly, I'm talking to I'm talking to customers, and sometimes it's really difficult to get them to pin down their requests into something concrete where I can understand the motivation and prioritize it properly. Is that about right? Um, that's about right. Okay. Uh, redirect me if I get off base. Okay. okay? So, there, first of all, that's a challenge, right? I'm not going to tell you that there's some silver bullet to it, but uh, there are a couple tools that can help you. I, I'm always asking for screenshots, videos, that sort of thing. Let me see it. Engine, because there's also that layer of translation between me and engineering, typically, that where a lot of things can get lost. Um, so, it's very helpful if we just have assets. Uh, as you, as you hinted at, I find it very helpful to ask, what are you trying to accomplish or what are your users trying to accomplish in this way? What are, what's the intention here? Why doesn't the other thing work? What, it, what would you be able to do if this worked better? Um, and slowly, you'll tease it out, right? It'll take a little bit of time. And I don't think it's well done over, over email, typically. Um, I find that this is when you really don't understand what they're asking. Usually I need to get on the phone and share screens. Um, when people commit that amount of time, first of all, you know that it's important to them. And secondly, they're, they're with you. They have, they've stepped into the ring and now you're, now you're going to work on this together. Um, so you get a little le different level of commitment and camaraderie. And I think the most, 
the thing that will shut down, that down the fastest is if you get defensive. I'm not suggesting that you would, but it's very easy to do. This is your baby. You've been working on it. This is, you've been working on this thing for maybe years. It's hard. If, and when people criticize it to stay not just level, but empathetic and understanding and always curious to understand why that, what the impact is for them. And, uh, that, that helps to elicit a much more positive response. And it gets me to those answers of really, how much does this matter? Who does it matter? Who in your organization does it matter to? Um, are there workarounds available? What, what sort of thing? And you, you specifically mentioned what's fair to ask of a lead customer. I think that you are doing them a disservice if you don't pursue it until you understand it. Right? The, I, I spend a lot of time on, pho- on the phone with executives at really big companies whose time is valuable. They almost always are willing to give me more time if I ask for it because we stay on that empathetic level and I try and immediately turn it to, oh, how can I, how can I make that better for you? How can I make that better for you? And then the last thing, uh, that isn't quite directed to your question, but I think is really important is you have to be honest and realistic with them. It is, it will break down your relationship very quickly in my experience if you are overly optimistic. It is so hard not to be overly optimistic when someone is upset with you and you just want to fix it. You're like, I, I think we can do that. Absolutely. You're really important to us. We'll have it to you next month, right? Some, some places next month is a million years away, but in my business, next month is, <laughs> it's too fast for almost anything except for a simple bug fix. When I have that conversation and I'm realistic with the person, I find that they're way more understanding than I expect. Like I'm trying to resolve this. I remember the first time I came from a startup to a Fortune 500 company, right? And the speed changes. <laughs> they, the processes get a lot heavier. Everything changes. And the first time I had to tell a customer, yeah, that's on my roadmap. We're going to deliver it. It's going to be about eight months. I was blushing to beat the band. I mean, I was sweating. I was like, I'm going to get killed. Like, yeah, sorry that that's costing you millions of dollars. We'll fix it in eight months. I thought I was getting creamed. And they were just like, okay, great. Thanks. That was the end of our call. Okay, great. Thanks. Can you, do, uh, can you just give me an update in, in six months? I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. That is not what I expected. And I, my instinct was too fearful to give that answer. I would have, it would have, I would have almost preferred to avoid any uh, conflict and just said, we'll do it as fast as we can, stay vague, or we'll do it next month. And then it got delayed and then it got delayed and then it got delayed. Maybe you forgot about it. Please don't talk to me anymore. <laughs> Um, go talk to your account executive. Don't talk to me. But that honesty is really important. So as long as, um, ask for as much as you need, I think, you know, be prepared. Don't, uh, don't waste their time, but ask for as much as you need. Stay empathetic and curious and always trying to walk in their shoes. People feel that and then be honest with them on the back end. And I think you'll find that because it's probably not the last time you're going to talk to them either. That conversation gets healthy. Is there another question? Please. About one of the things I find that you're always trying to reprioritize and really listen in, like a, a different data point is always just around the corner. Sure. Right? So, like committing into the future and giving customers commitments and having a long, stable roadmap that people like sales, marketing really like mm-hmm. is in conflict with the ability to reprioritize. Absolutely. So if you say things to you both being too often, you're now committed and you can't reprioritize. So, how do you balance those two? Um, sort of contradictory yeah. trends and sort of say, well, I can plan this far in advance in those work streams, but I need to keep a bit more flexibility here. And how do you sort of manage that? Concept? Yeah. There's a couple things that I think are really effective, and then there's a little bit of hedging. <laughs> all right. So, uh, first of all, we talked about separating urgent and important. You, part of the, the hardest part about maintaining a long-term roadmap or really executing against a strategy is a, is a, another way to phrase the exact same thing is to, you have to stay focused on what's important, what's going to make your customer more, more successful. Um, and that doesn't always mean fixing this bug. You know, I, you're going to have, I have dozens of bugs in my backlog. They don't all need to get done. They don't all need to get done as much as this, this other longer term strategic play. Now, the other piece of that is being able to communicate effectively to both your executives and to these stakeholders, account executives, whoever, 
exactly why these things are happening. That's not easy because again, they have different goals and incentives than you do. A salesperson might be like, I don't really care. I need to hit my end of year mark, right? That's my bonus. That's my livelihood. And that's tough. That's where you got to be firm a little bit. Like, this is what is important for the company and the product. And then the last piece is, there is a little bit of hedging there. You don't, I don't talk about things that I'm not committed to. Everything is a potential project or an option until we commit to it. And then there has to be a really good reason why it gets knocked off, which sometimes happens, right? Hey, we had this really urgent security issue come up. Nobody wants to screw around with security. That's the only way this company folds tomorrow, right? So I'm sorry that we didn't get to your thing. We'll get to it uh, next month, but that's what happened. It wasn't that you're unimportant, but this is what happened. But I don't talk about things that I'm not committed to, except there is this huge gap that nobody else gets to see between vision, hey, we have this vision for the product, and here's where we're headed. You need to know that so you can be inspired, right? So that people understand the vision of the company. And then... There's, here's what we are committed to executing against, which is typically for me three to six months. Uh, that's, that's where I can see far enough in advance to really give you something. And then there's this middle gap of like sort of six months to two years that I don't talk about. There's a lot of options there. Maybe I have ideas. Frankly, I find it's best not to fall in love with your ideas that are 12 months out anyway. They're gonna, like, it's not, it's not just, other people who are disappointed. You'll fall in love with your feature. You'll start making poor decisions because you really wanted to ship that thing um, and you wanted to add it to your portfolio. It's not going to happen. So I, I keep that, that middle ground. I, I commit to what I know I can commit to, barring a very unusual, unpredictable circumstance. I don't commit to anything else. And, and that way people, but people have enough vision that they can sell it. They said, this is, this is where we're heading. Right? This is where the puck is going. How do we get there all along the way? It's details that they mostly don't care about anyway. <laughs> Does that help? Yeah, that's great. It's, it's always that thing of exactly how far can you commit yeah. versus I'm locking myself into future decisions. Mm -hmm. and like, so I think four to six months is really similar to where we've ended up in the past, but it's one of the bits I'm always most insecure about. So it's good yeah, to I think it's fair. It's um, Because if you, if you go out a little further than that, it's unrealistic. You're in, really, the key is you need to have enough of the bridge built for your teams, to, for your marketing, your engineering, whoever, to keep walking that bridge. And then you need enough of a vision of what it looks like on the other side that everyone wants to keep walking with you and they believe you're going somewhere worth, worth the trouble. So if you got those pieces, the middle bit, I think, I find is actually a lot less important than people say. They want that to your roadmap. Just don't, you can't, you can't offer that. Um, and nobody misses anything. Yes? I think for all the tips, you find that very relatable being in oh, the thank you. management role. Good, I hope it was helpful. <laughs> yeah, I hope it was helpful. Um, I'm curious, have you ever run into a scenario, hypothetically, let's say in marketing, <laughs> <laughs> the leadership level, the C level, and executive leadership, yes, let's do this, we're in it, we're yeah, in absolutely. it. What not, or when you go down in the trenches level, at the tactical level, they're just not ready for the change. They're just not ready for the new product or the new feature that we're yeah. supposed to be building out for with a big long roadmap for like the next few years. Yeah. What's the question? So the question is, have you run into that and what has helped you out? Well, all of you live in San Francisco, I presume, so you've probably seen a little thing called Dreamforce, yeah. which is our marketing people's like Nirvana, uh, yeah. There, are, there are times where marketing and or sales or whoever is a little bit ahead of where you actually are. Uh, <laughs> guess what? You want to close the deal? I, yeah. I I built a feature not that long ago. Um, not at Salesforce, but for for a sales, someone had already sold this big account on a feature that did not exist, does not work as they claimed it did, and it was like. And the only, I don't, I don't, uh, suggest that you build a lot of one-off things, but when you're in violation of your contracts, uh, you're in kind of a tight spot. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that happens. And I think that's where this communication piece, that honesty and being able to explain where you are really clearly in a way that people follow, uh, is absolutely critical. You have to be a little bit brave when you're, when you're looking up the chain. Uh, 
hopefully you're in a place where that's encouraged. If not, maybe they'll learn to value it after you save them a flop on their face. Because, uh, but it, just saying we can't, we can't do that, or we're not ready, things like that. Every executive is just like, are you kidding? I, I eat that for breakfast. We can't? No. This is how we're going to disrupt it. This is how we're going to break it. This is we're going to make it better. That is opportunity when I hear can't be done. When I hear we have these six things that need to happen before that makes any sense. Do you want me to stop doing them? And I look at that list. That is the sobering moment as, as a business leader and as an executive where I say, okay, crap. Those six things are more important than the seventh thing I'm trying to put in here. Absolutely. And if yeah. Flip it mm -hmm. And actually go that, yes, we should be there. It is the right thing to do it. How do you convince the majority? Well, I, first of all, I'm not saying that the answer should always be no, yeah. right? 90% of the time it is. But <laughs> it shouldn't always be no. Sometimes the answer is, yeah, that one thing should be at the top of this list. Bump everything else down. I don't care if that sixth thing doesn't get done. That happens just as often, frankly. So you gotta be a little bit nimble there. And then if you want to, if you are the person advocating such a radical shift, again, I don't think that's infeasible, but you have to be able to frame it for people in a way that it's not your passion project. It's not, it's, it's gotta rest on common values. I guess it's a better way to put it. It's gotta rest on common values. Maybe that common value is all about your customer success. Maybe it's about, maybe it's about dollars. Maybe it's about the top line. Maybe it's about cost savings. I don't know what your company is, but you got to frame it in terms of common values so that people can understand it in a way that resonates with them. And then you need to be able to explain that either with some of the lightweight stuff that we've talked about tonight for, uh, for that sort of everyday project or if you really want to go big, you got to go big and you got to, you got to come prepared with your research. You got to come prepared with your data and you got to, and every little piece has to be tied up so that we can rest this on common values. This is going to make our customers more successful. Make me believe that. Then you got your priority. Does that make sense? Yep. Thank you. That's how I've seen it work anyway. Uh, hold on. We had this question in the back first and I see a couple, three more and then probably we'll cut it off with the people who have their hands up. Uh, so in the back. Good for you. <laughs> They're not easy to get. And um, I got this really interesting question. Um, the company that I was interviewing with has an interesting business model in which sometimes they'll get a huge infusion of resources to um, product, and very quickly uh, the product manager has to make a decision how to invest those resources. Um, and my first instinct was like, yes, I guess I like tackle my backlog, but then I kind of started to think about it more broadly. Um, and I'd love to hear your, how you would answer that question. Okay. So again, repeating for the microphone, uh, you had an interview and this company was having an issue where sometimes they get this unpredictable, huge flush of resources and they need to figure out what to do with that. And is the, is the best answer just to clear out your bug backlog or is it something else? I, <laughs> part of having lots of vision and ideas is that you already have a big backlog of features that you don't really talk to anybody about. It builds up whether you want it to or not. That thing you really wanted to get to and you just couldn't or, or something, there was some limitation, there was something you couldn't get to. I think those things kind of build up naturally over time. It's really, uh, that doesn't help you in like your first six, 12 months on the job, but I think that that question will be easier and easier to answer as you have experience with that company. Now, to, if you're a new person coming in, how do I handle that? First of all, you need to have this vision of where the product is going or nobody is going to want to come along with you, right? There is, there is that moment when you are working late and you are thinking, why am I doing this? There's got to be something cool. <laughs> There's got to be something inspiring at the end. So you need that vision. And putting together the steps in between is, is it more about doing the work, doing the research, figuring that out? So if I were you, if I, and I was asked, how do you deal with this huge influx of, of resources? How do you understand what to do with that? First, I start at the beginning with my customer. I go in and do my research. If that's available, great. You save me a step, but I need to go figure out what success looks like here. What is our goal? What is the priority? Then I need to come at it with a few, a few ideas. Most of them, frankly, generated from your customers 
others, people who have experience in your business are going to have offhand. And then you're going to be able to, do, you're going to listen to all these inputs and come up with some creative ideas along the way yourself and be able to fill in the gaps. And then I need to go and vet all of those out. So the, I think the answer often is don't start running before the road is built. You will fall on your face or whatever you fall on when the road isn't built. <laughs> the, you have to, you have to walk those steps. There's no, there's no short changing it. Um, very quickly you will have those steps ready and to pull out of your, uh, to pull out of your quiver, but they won't be there right away. And when they're not there right away, you need to go hit the pound the pavement, talk to your customers, figure it out, uh, and, and fill in and come up with the things that actually matter to your business. If I were in the interview, I would want to tie that specifically to a few ideas around this company's product. Uh, so you should walk in prepared, know what the company's product is and what success looks like for them, or ask what success looks like for them. You can ask things in interviews. I recommend it. And then you, and then you can tie those pieces together a little bit for them. You'll come up with examples that aren't exactly accurate, but it doesn't matter. You'll have walked through the right process. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Okay, I think we had three more questions. I'm just going to go from right to left. Mentioned that you always try to do decision based on data. My question would be, where do you get your data from mm. in order to have a base of your decision making process? So you said I always try and make my decisions based on data. Where do you get that data from? Right? Okay, so first of all, there's a key word in there, try. You will not always have the data. In fact, I think that's something where a lot of people stall out is in user research, they want the user to tell them the answer. And uh, in in data mining or going through their data, they they want a really clear answer with everything tied up. And that people can become uncomfortable with uh, a lack of clarity. But there will always be blind spots. There will always be gaps, especially when you're trying to build the next thing, right? So I take the data where I have it. First of all, we invest in that release over release, making, anticipating the questions that we're going to want to ask to hit our vision. Um, and what are the, and refining the gaps in our understanding and figuring out how our metrics sometimes don't tie in the way we expect them to. Sometimes there are surprises. So you take the data where you can and treat that as sort of your island, right? Uh, and, and you gotta build bridges in between that. The number one way to do that is talk to your customer. I know that's getting a little bit redundant, but people frankly don't do it. They don't. They talk to their customer in their first three months on the job, and they're like, I got it. I got it, I got customer cases coming in. I hear from the customer. It's not true. You have to go out there. I mean, right before I was at this, we just, I was at a debrief for a user research session. We talked to 10 users, showing them prototype designs of a feature that we want to build. You know what? They told us a lot of things that were wrong with it. They told us, and they focused us on a few things that were right about it. Now, that's not data in the sense that, that your data scientist might think of it, but it is data in the sense in the, what the product manager needs. And then you can go back to them over and over. I start I start with what are these what are these problems? Here's an idea. A month later, here's an idea I had to solve these problems. A month later, here's the designs we have around to solve that problem. Does this, is this actually solving your issue? Am I on the right track? Did I get si sidetracked? And you come back to that over and over. And then I guess to fill in the last of the gaps, you rely on the expertise and experience of the team around you. There's a, there's a certain point where if you're building something novel, people can't hand you the answer, and so you need to you will need to do that. And that's, again, where these decision-making tools, and there are a dozen more that are available to you, become really important because it identifies gaps in your thinking, and it reveals leaps in logic, and it gets you to a place where you not only have an answer, you have an answer that you can explain over and over, that you can defend, that you can understand, and when, if it proves wrong, you have all that work that you can go back to and figure out what went wrong there so that you can improve your product for the next time and improve your process as well. Does that help? Awesome. Okay, uh, I saw a question in the middle here. Uh, all right, I'm gonna get to you in the back in just a sec. Blue shirt, yeah. sorry man. Um, so, similar to him, he said, um, what do you do when you don't have enough uh, data? Um, do you run smoke tests? Uh, as you said, focus groups is one thing. Mm -hmm. You launch to like a smaller subset, um, like a community that you think is similar. To, yeah. Um, and then how do you put that in your roadmap? Like you said, aggressively roadmap, but that's kind of like you're going off the road. <laughs> so the question is, when you don't have the data, there's some other things that you might do, like A-B testing, smoke testing, these sorts of things, and how do you put that on your roadmap? That 
is on my roadmap. It is not on my engineer. It's not on the part of it that I can communicate to our engineers, right? So we just lost our UX person, but I have a UX roadmap. I have a research roadmap. I have all these different pieces because by the time it lands on engineering's desk, it should be tight. You don't want people wasting time on a product that, on a feature that you don't really understand. You're going to look like an idiot, first of all, if you come in and they ask you, how does this thing work? And you're like, I don't know, how do you think it should work? Um, <laughs> you're going to lose a lot of credibility is more important than looking like an idiot. But you're also going to waste a lot of people's time with questions that you could have answered with your skill set. So I, I guess don't focus on roadmap as necessarily, the, the roadmap is not the same thing as your sprint wall. It's not even the same thing as your epic. The roadmap is, it needs to layer in all those pieces that have to come together to build a great product. You are responsible for making sure that those things layer in together well. And if the timing of them doesn't line up, you, you should really think about how do I improve on that. So you, you that's part of knowing what's coming, um, you know, six months ahead is that, or four to six months ahead. The reason I even go bother going out that far is because I need to go out that far in order to lay all the groundwork before someone can come in and build the thing. Does that help? Yeah. Okay, awesome. And then last question in the back, and then everyone's, of course, free to hang out and, I don't know, in this basement, and I'll be around for a bit. And uh, you can just ask me whatever specific questions you were too shy to say in front of the group. Cool? All right, last one in the back. Yeah, thank you. So you talked about ROI as one of your trade-offs for when making decisions. Yep. So do you mean simply the monetary value, as in cost, no. resources, over time versus projected sales, or what other units do you actually use for, for ROI? That's a very fair question. So we have, the question is, when we talk about return on investment, ROI, uh, what are sort of the units that we use to calculate that? And I think you're right. Ideally, uh, just to get to a total level, you would love to tie that to dollars, right? Here is the dollars of my engineering time or everyone else's time at this company, the marketing that goes behind a new feature, and then here are the dollars that we expect to get out of that. I have almost, I have almost never been in a situation where I could actually tie all those things together. It's, it's too long a chain. You're going to be missing a lot of pieces. Um, typically, the way that I actually accomplish it is relative. It's not about... Uh, you, you can't get, to, you can almost never get to that absolute of like, I spend $10, I get $20. But you can get to a place of relative value. Uh, I'll give you a, a very simplified example to start with. Hey, I've got this one bug that has one customer case attached to it. I've got this other bug that has three customer cases attached to it. Right? And when I say customer cases, customers have reported this as a problem for them. No other information. I go on and do the thing that has three customer cases attached to it because it's, I, I believe that they're comparable amount of work and the return is roughly three times, right? I don't have a great measure of that. But you can also extend that to features and lots of other things. Part of doing this research that we just discussed is asking people and trying to peg the value of this versus other things. Um, and, and, you know, to the best you can in an absolute sense, it's never perfect. Uh, it's, there's a part of it that's a bit of an art, not a science. But if you get that relative ranking, that's actually what you need. You don't need the answer. Uh, the answer to what should I work on next is not, I will make $5 million off of this thing and I will make $4 million off of this thing. All I really need is, I will be more successful with this thing, with A, than I will with B. And now you know how to prioritize them. And you can do that all the way down in order to get the, in order to, so for the, the most important to rise to the top and the least important to fall to the bottom, that's the, that's the prioritization you need. Right? So, you won't, you won't, you will very rarely have that answer. I do recommend tying things to dollars as often as you can. It's mostly a good way to measure success and, and fight for more resources, but usually it's about that relative, uh, prioritization, not an absolute, uh, measure of value. Sure, thank you. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you all for sticking around. I really appreciate it.